probably half of what happened on the streets of Chicago in the 1920s, was legal. Joseph, Yellow Kid, Weil, was the king of the con men, and possibly of the entire 20th century. For one scam, he earned from ten to five hundred thousand dollars, but he has never deceived poor people. That's why some people even called him the Robin Hood of con men. Prologue. Joseph Weil was born in 1875 in a family of modest European immigrants mother is French, father is German, who kept a grocery store. Joe had to get up at five in the morning and stand behind the counter all day, leaving his post only to go to school. This turned out to be unbearable for a nimble blonde boy. At the age of 17, Joseph dropped out of school and got a job as a debt collector. However, this occupation did not satisfy his ambitions. Moreover he decided to marry and his fiancée was the most beautiful and smart girl of their district. When he brought the girl home, his mother took him to a corner and said, Son, she is too good for you. Such a girl needs a riches bond. I'll make money for anything she wants, and more to come. Joe said. And he didn't lie. Parasites. Soon he met Doc Merriweather, his first teacher, and the creator of a unique potion for skin, stomach and other diseases. The Merriweather's elixir was brewed in a huge vat in the basement of the doctor's house and 95% consisted rainwater, mixed with some buckthorn bark infusion, a laxative, and sweet liquor for taste. It was mainly advertised as a powerful parasite's cure. Such potions were very popular those days, especially in female focus group. When some lady had an unhealthy complexion or stomach problems, she was immediately blaming the parasites for everything, and the charming Dr. Merriweather with his elixir was always ready to help. Weil became doctor's assistant. The young man was playing a shell buyer. He was announcing that the doctor had saved his life with the help of a miraculous elixir that he bought for the whole family. During the season, Joe and the doctor did a good business in Illinois, Iowa and Wisconsin. So Ween returned home a rich man, ready to marry. They had a big wedding in Boston. Hands down. Weil always had a passion for horse racing, thoroughbred horses, and everything connected to it. He knew all rules of hippodrome life, but he was never participating. Because very quickly understood that racing, like casinos, is designed to take money from people, and it's impossible to win. However, for some reason this was beyond the understanding of most visitors of the Hippodrome. That's what attracted him. Gambling can force people to pay any amount of money, and Joe developed several scams to redirect this easy money into his pocket. A perfect example is the scam, the main character of which was the owner of Chicago's largest theater McAllister. Here is one of Joseph's racing scam stories. Once Joe placed an ad at the largest Chicago theater offering an opportunity to invest in a profitable business. Looks like a scam, right? But those times it wasn't suspicions at all and not only outcasts, but quite respectable gentlemen were happy to take the bait. Mr. McAllister, the owner of Chicago's theater contacted Weil and asked for details of the deal. On terms of the strictest confidentiality, our hero told that his sister's husband worked for the Western Union where he was receiving the results of every major race across the country. Weil offered to share information a couple of minutes before the betting would be closed. This is obviously a scam, you may resent. But McAllister was a passionate gambler, Weil had seen him on the racetrack. He immediately took the bait, his eyes were sparkling. Nothing excites players more than the opportunity to get insider information and a bet on the right horse. They agreed that McAllister would pay, sister's husband, $2,500, and $5,000 more to the guy from New York office who would, ignore, the fact that Chicago office holds up the results of the race. As soon as information about the winner arrives at Western Union, the operator would send a message, so-and-so horse is delayed at the start. This would mean that, so-and-so, won. McAllister would quickly place a bet, and in a couple of minutes the operator will send the official results of the race. Naturally, there was no sister's husband in Western Union. On the appointed day, McAllister came to the hall, 
where the scammers organized a fake sweepstakes, set up cash registers, hired petty crooks and prostitutes to make it look quoted. Fake operator of fake telegraph at the appointed time said, Colorado delays start. McAllister rushed to the checkout. But then two specially trained people from the extras started a fight right at the window. No matter how the theatrical producer tried to break through them, it was useless. He did not manage to make a bet before the official announcement of the results. When Weil found out about the failure, he began to tear out his hair. Now they owe 5,000 to the New York operator. It is still possible to negotiate with wife's brother, but the operator. Upset McAllister agreed to pay everyone, on condition that they would try to repeat the scam. No problem, Weil said. But not right away, otherwise they may suspect. Of course Joe repeated. About six months later, the unlucky producer invested 12,000 in a special device for reading messages from telegraph wires, an absolutely useless heavy iron box. But the police allegedly grabbed the installers of the device at the crime scene, so nothing came of it. After several scams, Weil bought a huge mansion in downtown Chicago and got his own racehorses. He gave most of the money to his wife, who invested it in real estate, and the rest spent on crazy parties. Joe felt completely unpunished, because he knew that the victims of his scam would never go to the police to admit that they wanted to illegally obtain information about the race. However, one woman ruined everything. Once Weil scammed private detective's girlfriend, she decided to revenge. The detective was following Joe day and night. He gathered enough evidence for Weil's first three-month sentence. The laws of that time did not consider fraud a serious crime. The Swamp View. After release, Joe decided to change the direction and turn to another inexhaustible source of scams, real estate. He organized the real estate development company, Michigan Elysium. He bought a cheap swamp near the Lake Michigan. The lake was a traditional summer vacation spot for the Chicago rich men. At a luxurious office with leather armchairs, he hung a panoramic photo collage demonstrating a yacht club, tennis courts, hunting grounds and other mythical entertainments of Elysium. Joe was not at all going to trade shares in the swamp. Everything was arranged much wittier. In a confidential conversation, he was offering the potential victim to become a member of the private Elysium Club and line up on its land. It was an exceptionally friendly free offer to the most respectable people of the city. The only caveat. In order to register ownership of the site, you need to drop into a special office, where everything will be done literally for $300, the cost price of swamp areas did not exceed a dollar. For a month Joe was giving and formalizing victims' memberships every day, and nobody got an idea to look his gift horse in the mouth. However, a month later, one curious customer reached the swamp. Next day the Elysium office mysteriously disappeared. Ween decided to celebrate his success in Paris, where he fell in love with cabaret and red-haired dancers. A friend in need, and a fraud indeed. When Joe, squandered in Paris, returned to Chicago, he desperately needed money. He decided to pull off one of his classic scams. A swindler in the best Parisian suit and a huge ring on his finger, came to a restaurant with a friend, pretending that they were not together. Weil sat down, and his friend stood at the bar and started asking everyone if they knew who was sitting in the corner. This is the heir of the best family in Chicago. But a complete varmint and party animal. Big Spender ordered a luxurious dinner, invited the girls to join him, chatted with the owner of the restraint, who tried his best to please the millionaire. In the end, Joe asked the owner to keep his family ring in the safe. Because diamonds do not belong to the place where we go now. The next morning, Joe sent a word to the owner of the restaurant asking him to go to the pawn shop and take $500 under the ring, because he had squandered. The restaurateur was glad to please and also made sure that the ring was real. About a week later, Joe repeated everything at the same restaurant. But this time the owner just sent money, knowing that the ring is real and the rich heir would pay back. 
Surprisingly, the air never came and the ring turned out to be a cheap fake. One of the restaurateurs reported Joe to the police. Buckminster, the detective investigating this case, was an expert in his field and quickly tracked down Weil. One day, Buckminster stopped a swindler on the street after another scam. He was going to arrest Joseph. When Weil suddenly pulled a wad of money out of his pocket and thrust it into Buckminster's hand. What is it? Asked the slightly bewildered policeman. $8,000. Change I made this morning. I can take you as a partner. That's how Weil met his best friend and partner in crime for the next couple of decades. The converted Buckminster got the nickname Deacon for the physiognomy of the saint. He was assisting Joe in his classic dog scam. Thank you for watching. This story can be an entertaining topic at the dinner table because everybody enjoys to listen people with a good story. Share, like, subscribe, you know what to do. Leave us a comment what other topics you would discuss at the dinner table.